this is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello, my name is Gordon Smith. I'm a neuromuscular neurologist interested in peripheral neuropathy, and I also chair the Department of Neurology at VCU in Richmond, Virginia. Today, I've got the real pleasure of talking with a good friend and colleague, Michael Lunn, who is a professor of clinical neurology and consultant at Queen Square at the University College of London, where he is also the clinical lead in neuroimmunology. Michael is an internationally recognized expert in inflammatory neuropathy and has agreed to join us today on the podcast to talk about his team's research exploring the relationship between COVID-19 vaccination and Guillain-Barre syndrome, and also the relationship between COVID infection and GBS. Mike, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast today. It's a pleasure, Gordon. Thanks for asking me to come on. This is a timely and important topic, you know, the question both about the relationship between GBS and infection with COVID-19 and in particular exposure to the different types of of vaccines. And I, I wonder if we might start with a discussion about vaccination risk, because this is uh, top of mind f- for many of us. Your recent paper published last year in Brain titled COVID-19 Vaccination and Guillain-Barre Syndrome Analyses Using the National Immunoglobulin Database was really interesting. And I wonder, maybe you can just give us the meat. What's the bottom line? Is there a relationship between COVID-19 vaccination and GBS? Yeah, Gordon, thank you very much. It was a very interesting study, and I was surprised by the findings that we actually managed to produce from that study. There is a risk, and the bottom line is that there are about 5.8 cases of GBS per million doses of COVID-19 vaccination. But that's really entirely limited to vaccination with the vaccines that have an adenovirus vector, and it doesn't occur with any of the other vaccines, or at least the vaccines that we use in the UK, that's Moderna and Pfizer. And it only occurs with first doses as well. It doesn't appear to occur with the second dose. I was slightly surprised to actually find that relationship because before we started vaccinating and at the time of starting the vaccination program in December 2020, and in the beginning of 2021, I was pretty convinced that there was no link between COVID-19 and GBS. And therefore, I was fairly happy to start from the assumption that there would not be a link between COVID-19 vaccination and GBS, but was slightly surprised that with the resources that we have in the UK to study this subject, that we did actually find that link. I want to go back and talk about how you did this because it's quite an achievement to be able to detect that small incremental risk. But I know our listeners in the United States are wondering what this means for us. And as of the recording today, I think we have three vaccines in the U.S. We've got the same two mRNA vaccines that I suspect you have in the U.K. So we have the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna. But we also have Novamax, which is a protein adjuvant. Any recommendations or concerns for our listeners who have access to these vaccines? So I think the answer to that is I don't really have any concerns at all, particularly for those vaccines. So the AstraZeneca vaccine was in the UK, was our adenovirus vectored vaccine. And for you, the Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine was the adenovirus vectored vaccine. And it seems to be the adenovirus vectored vaccines that caused the problem. The mRNA vaccines, the Moderna and Pfizer, they're pegylated and they don't have the same structure. And what's really interesting and maybe to discuss later is that the vaccination with adenovirus vectored vaccines associated with GBS suggests that actually it might be the adenovirus vector that is the common link between those. And it might be that adenovirus is the unexplained infectious link to seasonal variations in GBS that we see, because of course, nobody really tests for common cold virus uh, that uh, we all get. And how often do we do a PCR for adenovirus when we get a cold? And the answer to that is never. And I suspect that adenovirus as an infectious virus has something to do with the natural seasonal fluctuation of GBS uh, as well. So it might tell us a little bit about the causation of GBS that we've been looking for for all these years. That's really interesting, Mike. Has anyone actually looked to see if there's any reason to suspect why adenovirus might lead to GBS risk? Is there a molecular mimicry issue or is this unexplored territory at this point? 
Well, pretty unexplored territory, actually. People have looked in the past, um, probably the earliest paper in the mid-1990s, with, uh, of course, older technology, identified about 50% of cases of GBS with adenovirus antibodies. In more recent studies performed in the Netherlands, the link to GBS and adenovirus has been made in about 1% or 2% of cases, but again, using technologies that perhaps are now 10 years old. So nobody's actually looked at it subsequently. We've actually got some research going on at the moment to look at the specific uh, antibodies in patients who had GBS, who had GBS following one of the adenovirus vectored vaccines and who had an adenovirus vectored vaccine and no GBS. Um, But actually, surprisingly, we can't see all that much in terms of antibody production related to adenovirus that links the vaccine to GBS. So I think that remains unexplained. And of course, we may have missed the boat at this point in time, because thankfully, numbers of cases of COVID have gone down substantially. Everybody's vaccinated already. And the numbers of cases of GBS that we seem to be able to associate with anything have disappeared pretty much. It's really remarkable to me that you started with almost a T4 translational study, right? Looking at very large data sets, which I want to get to in a moment. And you end up back in the laboratory to understand what you discovered looking at that big data set, which I find exciting. Maybe you can tell us about the big data. How are you able to do this? What was the approach? We are extremely fortunate in the UK in having a national health service. There are many problems with a national health service that's purely government funded, but it is what it says. It is a national health service and covers all of the areas of the United Kingdom in various ways. Many years ago now, in about 2005, I became involved with NHS England IVIG program where we were trying to understand use of IVIG, regulate its use where it wasn't properly used and contract it properly so that we had the right amount of IVIG in terms of shortages. And as part of that, it was made mandatory that every dose of IVIG given in the UK was logged in a central database. And every patient who needed IVIG was also verified by an independent panel of clinicians at the local hospital trust level. So over many years, we've collected national level data about the use of IVIG. Now, of course, Guillain-Barre syndrome, although it can be treated either with IVIG or plasma exchange if it needs to be treated, in general is largely treated with IVIG in almost every case at the current time. And so back in 2005, I was asked to be part of the NHS England IVIG database, which we set up at that stage. The great thing about the NHS is that it is a national system and covers the whole of the United Kingdom and its whole population. In 2005, we were interested in understanding use of IVIG and it's also its misuse, understanding who it was used in and how effective it was in order to contract IVIG and get the right amounts in and also prevent shortages and many other reasons. So at that stage, we set up a national database and it is mandated in the UK that every dose of IVIG is logged into that database and every patient receiving IVIG is assessed by an independent panel before they're given IVIG to make sure that the IVIG is appropriate. And so therefore, we've collected many years of data, 15, 18 years of data now on the use of IVIG across the UK. In Guillain-Barre syndrome, of course, most people who need to be treated, those who arrive at hospital, are treated with IVIG and a very small number with plasma exchange and perhaps an even smaller number don't get treated at all. But we know that at least 85 to 90 percent of people arriving in hospital in the UK are treated with IVIG. So I realised this would be a useful place to go and look and capture the GBS occurring in the UK. And we had already done that during COVID-19, which we'll come back to. The other great thing about the NHS is that everybody has an NHS number. That not only logs their IVIG doses, but also in a separate database, logs every dose of vaccine that everybody's had, exactly when it was given and exactly what type of vaccine it was. And so with approval from ethics committees and the government, we joined up the doses of vaccine and the doses of IVIG and therefore could do what's called an ecological analysis and link the episodes of GBS 
treated with IVIG to vaccine doses. And when you look at the paper, you'll see there that there is a clear peak in cases of GBS linked to the first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine only, occurring about 24 or 25 days after dosing. And across the whole of the UK, 65 million people, that equates to just under 200 cases of GBS that we could link to all of that vaccination. By the time you get beyond 42 days, you get back to baseline and the GBS cases that are linked to the Pfizer vaccine in time just tick along at a rate of two or three per day across the UK and there's no link to that at all. So this is a unique resource. It's a huge resource. It is obsessively logged by the government and actually fortuitously, although uh, it's slightly painful for us all to have to fill in, actually has provided the background data to do this big data research, which nobody else is able to do. Well, and that really gives you an unbiased look at the question, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. Because we have a whole population view of what's going on. We're not taking a small sample for whatever reason, particular attendance at hospital or a group of hospitals or a particular area. We log those data throughout the year. We can see the seasonal variations occurring in Guillain-Barre syndrome. We know that the number of cases that we log is consistent with the epidemiological studies that have been performed over many years in GBS. So we have all sorts of caveats that can sort of make the data more secure. And we understand that those data are are pretty reliable in terms of the numbers. There are other studies that have been done using other methodologies, often passive reporting, for instance. There was another study done in the UK, uh, centred in Oxford, using the general practice database. That requires people to look at hospital coding data from general practice, which of course is retrospectively reported often by non-medics into a database which is then subsequently searched. There's no independent assessment of those data and therefore those sorts of studies get different numbers to those which we've got. And of course the other studies also illustrated by part of our paper in BRAIN where we tried to collect a cohort of those cases with GBS by asking UK clinicians to report to us any case of GBS they saw associated with vaccination or not, demonstrates simply that in these sorts of epidemiological studies, you get a whole load of reporting bias. Ordinary GBS doesn't excite people, they don't report it. GBS that they think is associated with a vaccine because other people are interested in it, we find that they report quite a lot. And the surveillance study indicated that uh, over 80% of the cases reported were associated with vaccination, when we know that at the stage that they were reported, only 30% of people in the UK had actually been vaccinated. So within our study, we've demonstrated that we can identify epidemiological bias with reporting methods. But the point of the study is that we have an unbiased database through which we can identify accurate numbers. And that's why I think these figures that we can report in that study are pretty reliable. You know, Mike, I think that really is super interesting. And it certainly reflects our experience in at least the initial analysis of the swine flu GBS relationship back from the 1970s, similar sorts of reporting biases and that. But I wonder if we could spend the last few minutes talking about the work your team has done looking at the relationship between COVID-19 infection, not vaccination, but infection and Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, You you published a really, another really interesting paper in Brain early in the pandemic, but I think you probably continued that work. What's the story there? That was really what set the vaccine story off with the influenza uh, swine flu that you just referred to in the 1970s. There has been an annual search for vaccination related GBS because it became an adverse event of special interest after that GBS problem. And people have been looking hard for GBS ever since. And there are a few studies demonstrating that about one case of GBS occurs per million influenza vaccines given on a pretty you know, regular annual basis ever since. So, of course, there was particular interest in COVID as a new virus and whether that would set off GBS, also related, of course, to Zika virus, which had occurred five or six years ago. 
and the fact that there had been a handful of cases associated with SARS-CoV-1 and MERS that, of course, were self-limiting coronaviruses 10 years ago. Interestingly, when you go back to those original papers of inflammatory neuropathies associated with the SARS-CoV-1 and MERS, actually the numbers of cases of inflammatory neuropathy associated with those was literally a handful. There are no more than 10 cases in the literature. But those 10 cases and the influenza, swine flu, etc., made everybody extremely nervous that something was going to happen. So at that point, I decided we should certainly look using the IVIG database as our resource, but also trying to, again, collect cases during 2020, where people thought COVID-19 was associated with GBS. And of course, we all saw the pictures from Italy of them being overwhelmed with seriously ill patients. And the few small case series that came out of Italy saying that GBS was associated with COVID-19 made everybody really worried. And then, of course, people, all my clinical colleagues in the UK, started reporting every case of GBS to me, whereupon I then developed quite bad acquisition anxiety because, of course, I wouldn't normally see every case of GBS in the UK. There are 1,200 a year, but I was being reported one or two or three per day and started worrying that maybe COVID-19 really was causing GBS. But we did the same sort of study I've just described subsequently for the vaccine for COVID-19 at the beginning. We could identify every case of GBS in the UK and demonstrated actually that there was about a 30% reduction in cases of GBS in the UK during 2020 compared to the previous years. And of course, that might be because people weren't going out, because they were wearing masks when they were, they weren't getting Campylobacter because they weren't having barbecues in their garden, etc. And that was an, an early criticism of that study. But we carried on with the study through 2020 and into 2021. And at the end of 2020, we had a big peak of COVID in the United Kingdom, and of course, it occurred worldwide as well, where lockdown rules were not changed. But actually, the numbers of cases of COVID went up, but the numbers of cases of GBS stayed resolutely down. So, of course, if COVID was causing GBS, you'd expect the GBS and the COVID to be linked, and they were not. So not only could we demonstrate there was a reduction in GBS during that year, but we could also demonstrate that the numbers of cases of GBS and the numbers of cases of COVID weren't linked. And actually, we also tried looking in different areas of the UK, big geographical areas, we divided it into 12 regions, and could demonstrate where there was more GBS there was not more COVID. And where there was more COVID, there was not more GBS. So the two COVID and GBS geographical areas weren't linked either. And then we did the surveillance study, uh, looking at the cases that were reported and demonstrating that they were no different, whether they were virus associated or not. Unlike, of course, some of the other complications we subsequently saw, like the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, which was pretty unique in its phenotype. The GBS we see that's associated with COVID vaccine or with COVID virus, which of course is not an association. There is no difference. You can't detect any difference in the GBS that occurs. And that also occurs with facial palsy. Remains associated in the literature, but facial palsy didn't occur more often and doesn't occur more often, even though that's widely written. So it's been a very interesting time of trying to prove a negative or perhaps not trying to prove a positive. I think what we've proven is there's no link of virus to GBS and there is a link of first dose AstraZeneca to GBS. Mike, thanks for that great answer. I wonder if we could take the opportunity to do a little compare and contrast. Those of our listeners who regularly listen to the Neurology Podcast may have heard my discussion with Haya Bashara from Haifa, Israel, who authored a paper recently regarding the relationship between COVID-19 infection and vaccination and Guillain-Barre syndrome. And they found no relationship whatsoever between vaccination and GBS. And I should point out that in Israel, everyone receives an mRNA vaccine. But Dr. Bashar's team did find relationship between COVID-19 infection and Guillain-Barre syndrome. I wonder if you could kind of explore why their results were a little different from yours. Part of it revolves around epidemiology and the difficulties of epidemiology and, and big data sets. Cases of rare diseases tend to cluster. So sometimes one picks up a cluster in a smallish population, 
And the Bashara population is only about 3 million. And therefore, the numbers of cases that are picked up in the Bashara paper are actually very small. And of course, there's a background rate of Guillain-Barre syndrome that we know is about 1.8 cases per 100,000 people per year. So you only need a few additional cases in a small cluster of numbers to make a significant difference to your odds ratio. So with small data sets, very easy to find a positive result. And of course, there are many small data sets in the, the world. And of course, the way that the United States is divided up into semi-small data sets sometimes produces similar results. I think for me, the Bashara paper is largely an epidemiological sampling issue. And I think that probably explains that result largely. Of course, the, the main take-home point is very similar to that which I've heard loud and clear from you, which is that the mRNA vaccines are not associated with an increased risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome, and that's something we should be sharing with our patients. The risks of vaccination are small, but they are there. That is the nature of vaccination. But of course, the AstraZeneca vaccine is not being used in the UK anymore. And you've already pointed out in the United States that you're on Pfizer and Moderna and then a, a protein vaccine. So we can be reassured by that. Also, there are some other papers of interest that patients who've had GBS before or who have CIDP. Nobody's managed to prove any link between recurrences of CIDP or worsening of CIDP or further episodes of GBS either. So there's real reassurance in these data, which I'm very happy to publish against my name, tell my patients, and in fact, even vaccinate my family as well. So. So, Mike, this has been a really amazing discussion that I know our listeners are also excited about. And I, I think one of the things I always hear from people who do listen to the podcast is they'd like to know about the person behind the story. And you're clearly a really not only interesting story, but an interesting person. I, I'd love to hear what your journey has been with this. This all sounds very non-controversial when I talk to you right now, but I think particularly early in the pandemic, there was a lot of controversy around this. And I, there's nothing like vaccines and Lyme disease to get people riled up. So what's your journey been? Is there? It sounds like there may have been, just from prior conversations with you, some ups and downs in this. Yeah, I like to court a bit of controversy occasionally, but I do like to try not to cause too much trouble if I can. I landed in this really by accident. Although my interest, of course, is with Guillain-Barre and other inflammatory neuropathies, I felt compelled to look at the database in, in order to do this and therefore ended up doing quite a lot of epidemiological research that meant quite a lot to quite a lot of people. I didn't think it would be particularly controversial and thought it would be very reassuring. It's certainly very reassuring to me. But before the paper came out, I was hounded by a number of journalists who were absolutely convinced that there was a clear link between COVID-19 and Guillain-Barre syndrome. And at least one journalist threatened to report me to the General Medical Council saying that I was clearly obscuring data from the population, which I wasn't. It was just I was trying to get to a definite answer that I thought was reliable and I was convinced by. And of course, that same person and then the rest of the population came back to me when I started publishing about the vaccine. And when one of the broadsheet newspapers in the UK uh, picked this up and published it, there were more than a thousand comments on the article within a couple of hours and they had to take the comments section down because they were seriously unpleasant. And, and then stuff started coming in my Twitter X feed as well. And so I just turned it all off in the end. It's slightly unfortunate that everybody seems to think there's a conspiracy somewhere, but there isn't. It was really eye-opening actually to see people's responses, some people being much reassured, but most people just trying to be really horrible. So it slightly put me off doing anything more in this general environment. I'm sure I won't stop doing things in this general environment because that's part of life, but it was an interesting experience. Well, I don't think we often consider researchers as having to have courage in their work, but there is a need, particularly when in situations like this, in this day and age, science is really important. And thanks for sticking with it. I, I hope you remain engaged in social media. Certainly will be pushing out this podcast by social media because this is really informative and I think is going to be very valuable for our listeners. Mike, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been outstanding. Thanks, Gordon. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast podcast. 
through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes. Or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.